Ah, hello. Great. I hope everyone can hear me okay, both online and in the room. Um, can I also just check that uh, Marie Stella, who's our online uh, moderator, can also be heard through the Zoom link? Marie Stella, could you just say hello? Oh, maybe we've lost. Um, we can't hear you right now, Marie Stella. Perhaps our tech person can help. I, I think I am talking because I can see the transcription happening, actually. <laughs> yes, that's great. We can hear you now in the room as well. Uh, I think there was just a, the speaker was, was turned down. Um, okay. Brilliant. Um, good afternoon, everyone. We'll, we'll kick off um, now. My name is Jacqueline Rowe, and I work for an organization based in London called Global Partners Digital. And we work across a number of digital rights issues, and we're here today to talk in particular about um, a consortium project that we're taking part in, which is focused on government responses to disinformation across sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, so I'm joined today by my colleague Maristella Simiu, who is our online moderator. Maristella works for the uh, Center for Human Rights um, at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Um, and I'm glad to see that we have lots of participants online and some here in the room as well. So thank you all for coming. Um, maybe if I could just have, yes, that first slide. Um, one of the things that we'll be talking about a lot today is this new tool uh, that we've developed as part of this project work. The tool is called Lexota, as you may have guessed from the, the session title. Um, and at any point in the session, please do go and check the tool out. You can access it at lexota.org. And in the session today, we'll be explaining a bit about what it's for, uh, why we've built the tool, and how it's being used um, by advocates in the region. Um, you can also, these lightning talks are kind of designed to be interactive and win some audience participation. So please do feel free to, um, if you're online, put questions and comments in the chat at any point. Um, and we'll also have some time for Q&A at the end. And we'd also love to gather some audience participation and feedback. So we do have a little Mentimeter poll with uh, two questions on there for audience to feed, feed in. The first question to get you thinking as before we dive into the session is, um, is um, imprisonment ever a proportionate response to someone sharing disinformation online? Uh, and that's like a multiple choice question. You can say yes, no, or it depends. And then the second question is open-ended. It just asks, what do you think a rights-respecting response to online disinformation looks like? So if you'd like to contribute to that poll as well, you can either scan the QR code or go to menti.com uh, and uh, use the code that's there on the screen. Um, and we'll also take some, some answers from the floor as well when we come to the discussion at, at that point as well. Um, if I could have the next, the next slide. Um, thank you. So just briefly what we're going to do today, we only have 30 minutes, so we're just going to rush through um, briefly some welcome and introductions, which I'm doing now. Um, I'll then hand over to Marie Stella, who's going to give us a kind of scene setting background of the types of trends we've seen in government responses to disinformation in the region in recent years and how that links to international human rights law. Um, I'll then take the mic back and I'll do a quick demo of the Lexota tool showing you how we analyze these, these laws and these law enforcement actions and how, how we've based that assessment around the three-part test um, on permissible restrictions on freedom of expression as laid out in international human rights law. Um, and then at the end, it um, would be really great to have comments, feedback, questions, uh, insights from the floor, both online and, and our on-site participants. Um, so without further ado, I'll pass over to Mary Stella to give us um, a background. Okay, good uh, afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm not able to switch on my video. I don't know what's happening on that end. So I guess you'll just have to listen to my voice. Um, thank you very much, Jackie, for the introduction. As she said, my name is Mary Stella. I work with the Center for Human Rights at the University of Pretoria. And uh, basically, because we have a short session, I'm just going to dive into it because I'm basically looking at what is Lexota. You know, why did we uh, develop Lexota? And as a starting point, I think we can all agree this discussion about disinformation is one that we've been having from time to time. We know the impact 
of disinformation on our democracy. We know the impact of disinformation on our elections. We can agree that negatively it can erode trust in society, it can increase polarization. In certain instances, it does skew public decision making process as well as public debate. Um, it can promote hate speech in certain incidences and can actually even lead to violence and death. So we can agree that disinformation is an issue that needs to be addressed in society and one of the stakeholders involved in addressing disinformation are states. So with this tool exhorter, we tried to look at, you know, what are laws that are coming up in this space, what are government actions that are being implemented with regards to disinformation. Ma Mary Stella, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Yes. Apparently you can turn your video on now if you would like to. Um, sorry to interrupt, but in case you want to be seen as well. <laughs> Brilliant, okay, we can try. see you now. Thank you, to carry on. Okay, fine then, thank you um, for that. Um, uh, so I was saying with Lexvota, so what we were looking at with Lexvota is you know, what laws are coming up in this space, what government actions are being implemented with regards to disinformation. And really, are they in alignment with international laws and standards? Because we know states do have obligations under international law, in particular, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, as well as the African Charter on Human and People's Rights, because these are two instruments that have guarantees and protections under international law when it comes to freedom of expression. And we know states, most states have obligations under these instruments. So, for example, with the ICCPR in Africa, only South Sudan is not a member state to the ICCPR. And um, for the African Charter, only Morocco is not uh, a member state for the African Charter. And so with Lexota, we, in terms of the trends that we saw, what trends did we see with Lexota is that there's this increased criminalization of false news in the African continent, and it's actually in violation of international human rights law. And in particular, even the Declaration on Principles of Freedom of Expression and Access to Information, which is a soft law instrument, but developed from the African Charter. And what was concerning is that we saw these vague provisions uh, in these laws with regards to disinformation, they were broadly phrased, and they were open to wide interpretation. And when we looked at government action, what was also concerning is that these laws are disproportionately used to target certain critical voices in society, the media, civil society organizations, human rights defenders, you know, these opposition parties and candidates, these are critical voices in society that are used to hold states accountable. And with this disproportionate use of these laws and these actions, when it comes to disinformation and targeting these groups that actually play an important watchdog function in society, we see the risk of self-censorship happening in a number, a number of countries in Africa. And so we hope that with Lexota, given the analysis that we had undertaken in terms of what laws are emerging in this space, what actions are governments taking in this space, that it will be a reference point for advocacy, for CSOs, for human rights defenders to actually engage with their policymakers to see what laws, what regulations do we have? Are they actually rights-respecting approaches? How can we hold our states accountable under the obligations of the international law to ensure that regulations with regards to disinformation, as well as actions that are taken by states and other state actors are actually rights respecting? And even in doing so, how do we ensure that given our different contexts, we engage positively with our state actors in such a way that is not restrictive? Because um, we've recently been undertaking, for example, advocacy action around this, engaging with CBOs, uh, civil societies in different countries. And what we see is there's this depth of understanding what is disinformation, how do we approach disinformation and, and actually tackle disinformation in our countries. And it seems that the punitive way is the most common way of going about it, but in many instances, it's not right respecting when you look at it under the lens of international law. So through Lexota, we are hoping that it presents the starting points um, for, for civil society actors as well as other stakeholders just to engage positively with state actors to ensure that whatever approaches are being put in place with regards to addressing this information are actually rights respecting. So with that, I'm just going, it was just a bit of a snapshot of, of Lexota, the tool that we have and what we are discussing today and hoping that we'll have this rich discussion today around government approaches to disinformation and how it can be rights respecting. Uh, with that, I'm going to hand over the floor to Jackie, as I said, my session is quite short, but I'm looking forward to your, your input on this. Thank you very much, Jackie. 
Brilliant. Thank you, Mary Stella. And I'm really glad we got your video working. And thank you for that really helpful overview of some of the the, the background to why we've uh, been doing this project and why, why we think this tool is important. Um, I'm going to kind of show you a bit about the site. This is the web version. It's also available through, through mobile browsers as well. Um, and uh, just to highlight at the start of it that this is um, very much a joint project between not only uh, Global Partners Digital that I work for and the Center for Human Rights that Mary Stella is representing today, but also we're working with Article 19 West Africa, uh, with Sapesa, who are based in Uganda, and then Protej QV, based in Cameroon. Um, and so the Lexota tool and the, the project around it is really built around uh, this consortium model of information sharing, uh, comparing the state of play across different countries in the region and working together to advocate for more, these more rights respecting responses um, and we might maybe come back to some some of our partners in the room to, to share their perspectives as well um, in the in the discussion section um, but let's dive right into the tool you can see this is the the home page um, it gives you kind of some snapshots of the the types of laws that are in the database at the moment um, but what I want to do first is looking at the uh, comparison page where we, we can compare all of these different laws that are in the database. So across all of the 48 countries that we've looked at, we've collected, um, it's just under 100 laws, I think, at present, um, which include some kind of restriction on the sharing of disinformation, uh, either offline or online, um, but that could be applied to an online context. Um, so we have all this all this data. We've kind of included a link to, to the, the text of each one of those laws there, so users can quickly go and see the text itself. Um, but we also include, and this is kind of what Lexota is really designed to do, is to provide a uh, an analysis of our assessment of how compliant that law is with the three-part test um, for freedom of expression. And we do this through six questions. I'm just going to see if I can zoom in a bit. Great, yep. So we do this through a framework of six analytical questions that we apply to every single law. Um, I won't go through them in too much detail now because of time, but um, we can discuss the methodology more uh, later if that's of interest. So the first question is, is there clarity over the precise scope of the law? Is it clear to a user exactly what speech or content is restricted or is illegal? Um, and that's a lot of these laws that we've analyzed. The answer is no, because by its very nature, d disinformation or false news is very hard to define. Um, it's quite a subjective content category. Um, and in general, it's quite difficult to make it uh, specific in the same way that, for example, a defamation restriction requires material harm caused to someone else's reputation or financial gain. But with the definitions of disinformation, it's, it's much less clear and it's much harder to establish what the threshold is for that content falling within that content type. The second question that we ask is, is the speech or content within the law restricted only when it's in pursuit of a legitimate aim? So uh, only if that content is going to be causing some kind of concrete public harm or some kind of um, uh, infringement on the rights or reputations of others. This would be the situations in which you could permissibly restrict uh, disinformation, anything short of that, and it's not a legitimate aim. Um, the third question, do any restrictions in the law account for instances where the individual reasonably believed the information to be true? And this is really important because we see uh, lots of people might share false news or um, misleading information without even realizing it. And if they're subject to the same penalties as someone deliberately and maliciously trying to create information disorder, then that creates a real problem um, for, for freedom of expression. Um, and the response to that would not be to criminalize that person's actions, but to look at media literacy and media literacy training um, initiatives. Um, the fourth question are determinations of whether speech or content is disinformation made by an independent and impartial judicial authority. This is again really important so that people can know with clarity what counts as disinformation or what doesn't. And we find that laws that allow uh, government bodies or government ministries to be making those determinations is much more of a risk of that content type being applied to political criticism and then therefore that law being applied to being used for the purposes of political censorship. Uh, the fifth question is to do with the proportionality of the sanctions. Uh, we ask, are they proportionate or are they likely to be proportionate when the law is enforced? Uh, sometimes this isn't always clear from just reading the legal text itself, which is why in Lexota we include not just the laws themselves, but also instances of, of law enforcement action that's been taken under those laws, which it gives us more of a sense of, okay, well, it might say 
you know, a penalty of up to three years in prison, for example, you know, that should only be used in the most egregious cases. Uh, and if it's being used, if a journalist says something online that the government doesn't like, we can clearly say that's that's not a proportionate penalty uh, and would fail, therefore, that element of the, the three-part test. The final question is to do with uh, are intermediaries liable for third-party content. Uh, we've put this in because, um, I mean, in most of these laws, you'll see it's not applicable. They don't mention it. They don't refer to it. Um, but it's an important thing to think about because when governments do make intermediaries liable for online disinformation, it really incentivizes uh, over-removal and sometimes over-broad interpretation of what disinformation is by the platforms, which results in restrictions of speech um, in, in its own right. Um, that's a whistle-stop tour through the methodology. We could probably have a whole panel discussion on, on that alone, but maybe just to, to kind of... Uh, concretize it, I thought I'd just do a quick uh, example. Uh, I thought we'd look at Cameroon, as Cameroon is one of our target countries within this project. Uh, and we have uh, Avis Momeni here with us in person, who is um, with Protege QV, um, who is our partner organization in Cameroon. So Avis, do uh, jump in and correct me or fill in anything I miss here. Um, but you can see, so for each country profile, we don't just answer um, that those kind of yes-no responses to each of those questions I just talked you through, but we actually have a kind of text-based country profile, which starts off with an introduction, uh, summarizing the, the laws that are in the scope of the tool. So in the case of Cameroon, we have um, the 2010 law on cybersecurity and cybercrime in Cameroon, and we also have the penal code. Both of these include uh, restrictions uh, apl applying to false information. Um, so I thought we'd just take a quick look at the, the one for the penal code. You can see it sort of, you can expand the profile to get the details on the, on the law. And so for each one of those questions that I just talked us through, we have not only the answer, but also an explanation of, um, of our analysis of the law. Uh, in relation to that question. So we can see here for the for Cameroon's penal code, there are two relevant sections, section 113 and section 240. Um, and we basically uh, look at how those provisions are describing false information. Um, one of them says false information liable to injure public authorities or national unity. Uh, section 240 refers to anyone who is publishing or propagating uh, news without being able to prove that it's true or to prove that they had good reason to believe that it is true. Um, and our assessment is that these sections fail to provide clear enough guidance for individuals to conform their behavior um, in accordance with the law. It's not clear what would fall in the scope of false information. It's not clear how it would be assessed that that information would be liable to injure public authorities or national unity. Um, and it's not clear what the threshold would be for being able to prove the truth of a piece of information. Um, and so these more vague definitions um, beyond and not allowing an individual to know what they're meant to do under the law, they also provide an overly wide degree of discretion to those who are charged with the enforcement of the law, which, as I mentioned earlier, increases the risks of the law being used for, for example, political censorship. Um, we then kind of, I won't read through the whole profile, but it's just to give you a little, a little flavor of, um, of how we do this analysis and the kind of detail that we go into within the tool. And this assessment is available for each of the nearly 100 100 laws that are currently included in the data set. Um, so it's essentially, we hope, um, a really rich resource of information, of high quality legal analysis, um, that advocates in these countries where these provisions are in place um, can use to help them uh, critique and push back against some of these more problematic provisions and to advocate for a, a more rights respecting response. Um, what I might do, um, we've got about 10 minutes left of the session. Um, I don't think we've had any questions come through online, um, but I might open the floor for, for questions, comments, feedback, either from our online participants or from people in, in, in the room, um, and it would be great to hear your, your views on, this issues, on these issues as well. I can see we have one in the room. Um,
Perfect, thank you. I don't know how much of that our online participants could hear. Um, it was a really useful intervention um, from our guest here who was saying that it, uh, firstly it's really positive to see um, a tool developed specifically focused on sub-Saharan Africa, uh, which has often um, not been the focus of previous like legal research projects. Um, she was also saying that there's a, an ongoing project uh, where she works that's looking at a similar mapping and research project, but specifically focused on intermediary liability, which is really great. Um, and also pointing out that sometimes doing this kind of analysis or assessment is very hard to do um, in an objective way based on an abstract piece of legal text. And it's, it's as you mentioned, then case law and how the law is being used in practice is really important for that assessment. And that's also why we think that this consortium uh, model is so important because it provides us with um, greater understanding of local context in, in particular countries. Sadly, not all of the countries in the database. We're not a partnership of uh, 48 different countries. But, um, uh, and we also really welcome uh, the, the kind of, the tool is driven by like crowdsourced data as well. So we also have this kind of contact section of the tool uh, where we invite people if they have additional information or if they disagree with our analysis or if they have evidence to suggest that it's not being used in this way in practice, then we really, really value uh, people sharing uh, information through that and, and, and that's one of the ways we can follow up and ensure that it's more accurate and more um, up to date. Um, so thank you for that comment. Um, maybe I will uh, turn to, uh, maybe ask uh, some of our partners in the room to maybe share if anyone would like to, some experiences of the project, um, elements of Lexota that have been useful, elements that you hope will be improved uh, as we continue in our, in our collaboration, or any insights that you have about, uh, from advocating on these topics in your local contexts, um, any experiences you might want to share with, with the group as well. Uh, Avis, you look ready to speak. <laughs> Thanks so much, Jacqueline. Thanks to everyone. Uh, I'm great because as a lawyer, the tool is let's say, uh, more uh, useful for you, for your work. Not only for the lawyer, for the human rights defenders, even for governments, they so can improve themselves. And for civil society, different authors. So it is, it, you can go through the Lexota. I don't know where country are you are? Yeah, from Kenya, ah yes. So you can go through the Lexota and go through the law and you will watch these different points whose is a treat for civic space and eh, restricted. So it is a good thing. And I think, uh, as Shakini said, it is start points and it's very useful. Yes. I'm glad to feel as, as you are. You see it again, university. Oh, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Avis. Ashna. Thanks, Avis. Thanks, Jackie. And thanks, June. Always nice to see you. Um, so from Cipesa's perspective, I think one of the things that stood out when this project started, uh, especially during, uh, with the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, was seeing how many laws were passed on disinfo, misinfo related to COVID-19. Um, we're on the lookout to see how many of these laws are going to be repealed or not, how many of them are going to be repurposed or not. Uh, so that's something that we are keeping an ear on the ground for to see how things pan out in that regard. It's also obviously um, quite worrying to see that some of these problematic laws are being reviewed and amended to even be worse, which is the case in Uganda's Computer Misuse and Cyber Crimes Act. Um, yeah, so I think as June and Avis have said, it remains a very good advocacy tool but the onus is on us to keep uh, abreast of all the relevant developments so that it's you know, a resource that's live. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ashna. That's, yeah. um, and I think one of the things that maybe picking up on is um, different needs of different communities for, for very in-depth legal research. Um, then there might be the need for more, more detailed work and more detailed analysis and comparison. Whereas for um, human rights defenders or advocates or journalists that maybe don't have a legal background, um, then the degree of simplification that's necessary in this kind of database um, is, is sort of um, maybe a plus or maybe something that makes it more accessible as well. So maybe we can chat more about that after the session as well. I've also just seen a comment from, uh, from Guy Berger in the um, chat who's uh, questioned uh, looking at Nigeria 
earlier, for example, is there a place in the in the Lexota tool or template to cover actions that are arbitrary or the ones that are overturned by a court? And he references specifically Nigeria's Twitter ban. And I think this is a really interesting point and something that we've talked about a little bit as consortium partners as to whether we include um, things like case law within the database um, and how broad uh, we go in terms of things we're including. And so the decision that we've made um, so far is um, to keep the scope uh, narrow, so we only analyze uh, laws or regulations that impose a specific restriction on someone sharing false information. But I think you raise a good point, Guy, that um, it doesn't capture the full picture, um, and that whilst the Twitter ban um, uh, did, it, you know, affected many other content types as, as well as disinformation, but it was in part motivated by a desire to, to look at disinformation and control disinformation in the country. Um, so maybe we can, I've got a colleague taking lots of notes on this call and maybe that's one of the kind of takeaways that we can, can go away and think about as well. Um, we've just got a couple of minutes left. Maybe, um, Mary Stella, do you have any kind of final comments or thoughts you'd like to share as our online moderator or things that this discussion has raised for you? I, I hope you could hear the comments in the room okay. Yes, uh, we could hear the comments very well. Thank you very much, Jackie, and thank you very much, Guy, um, for the intervention. Actually, maybe we should also mention this and there's a section on resources on the page where we do post, for example, any developments in the field, uh, blog posts, um, and maybe interesting articles around disinformation and developments around this space in Sub-Saharan Africa, and um, development in terms of case law, in terms of jurisprudence around that, it would be great for them to be included there, just for anyone visiting the site, then you'll have um, a resource to look into, that would be great. Um, it would be great also to hear the, the results of the Mentimeter. I don't know if anybody engaged with that. I don't know if you've tracked that, Jackie, so that you can see um, what are the results of the Mentimeter. Otherwise, it's been a great short talk. Uh, yes, Maricela, that's a good point. So we didn't have, sadly, any solutions to the question, what does a rights-respecting response to disinformation <laughs> looks like? And I think maybe that's it's a very difficult question to ask and um, completely appreciate that's maybe, maybe out of like scope. <laughs> But we did have we did have some responses on uh, on the first question, which was just is imprisonment an appropriate punishment? Mm -hmm. Then we had seventy five percent of people said no, and twenty five percent of people said that it depends. So that gives us at least a snapshot of uh, people in the room's thoughts as well. But did you have something to come back on about the rights respecting response to disinformation, Maristella? Maybe you have some some ideas there. I was actually very interested in the results of the Mentimeter because I've also seen it's actually a contentious issue even in this space when you talk about uh, regulation, criminalization around this information and when you ask is imprisonment a uh, proportionate sanction, we see that the it depends question, um, uh, the it depends answer also emerges and I always pose the question which I think will just be uh, a food for thought for everyone. I've always asked, for example, in the context where this information leads to death uh, or serious injuries, uh, a civil sanctions, uh, a proportionate um, punishment for it, a proportionate way of addressing this information. And I've never quite gotten a satisfactory answer. So I'll also leave it as a food for thought for the participants as we move forward. I wonder if Guy has any, any feedback on that because I know he writes a lot around this particular aspect. But otherwise, thank you very much, Akin. Thanks, Mary Stella. Guy, would you would you like to come in at all on that on that point? Um, but I see um, Hello colleagues, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, we can. yes okay, great. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, my thinking about um, this question of harms is that harms should be linked to human rights. So they, they would be harms to, to dignity, there would be harms to reputation, there would be harms to safety, harms to public health, and, and that one shouldn't um, take harms as, or harms to, to the rights of children, but one shouldn't take harms as if somehow it was a standalone, an obvious question. And so I think it's important to assess laws in terms of how they are aligned to a, um, a breakdown of, of which rights are being harmed in particular. And otherwise, uh, you know, you get into a situation where harm can just be, you know, it harms your sensibilities or it harms your, your political interests. 
And I don't think anybody wants wants that. Well, obviously some people do want that. And then I've just also put um, in the chat, which is linked to this, that in assessing proportionality um, and and more, uh, the necessity for re restrictions, um, people will know about the Rabat plan of action. And I think that's quite useful in terms of also seeing to what extent um, this legislation is nuanced. And it does, it does take into account uh, what Susan Benesh calls uh, dangerous speech as opposed to just you know, generic um, speech, which, which may offend rights, but is not actually reaching the threshold of, of danger in a particular context. So um, it seems to me it's important that one does that. Otherwise, law can be um, set up to be quite absolutist and, um, and not take context into account. So that's, those but, are my remarks. Thank you so much, Guy. That was that was very insightful, um, and uh, yeah, it gives us a lot of food for thought about other resources that might be needed uh, to supplement the data that's in the Lexota tool, and other ways that we can uh, shed a bit more clarity on um, what an appropriate legal response uh, looks like and the types of thresholds that that should be in place. Um, so thank you for that. Um, I'm going to wrap up our session now. Uh, it feels like the conversation has just begun, um, but maybe we can continue some of these points offline. Um, thank you so much to Maristella for being our on-site moderator and to the, the Addis tech team who have been wonderful as well. Um, so thank you all for joining today and uh, look forward to connecting with you um, in different spaces. Okay, bye. <laughs>
Recording in progress.
is this yeah cool